And she has over 1,300 members in Charleston, Berkeley, Dorchester, and Colleton County. And we are now recognizing that these areas that we have formerly belong to several Native American tribes, and we've listed several of them up here for you. This is our leadership group, and we currently have two positions that are open, the conservation chair and the political chair. So if you think you might be interested, we would love to have you come and get involved with us. Please reach out to one of us and come and start taking part in all this good stuff. And right now, I would like to acknowledge Star Hazard. He's been our outings leader chair for many years. He's taken us to a lot of places, locally and statewide. And sadly for us, but good for Star, he's going to be stepping down from the chair position in December. And Star has done so much for us. And we, I right now would like to acknowledge him with a big round of applause for all he has done. Thank you a lot, Star. Now I'm gonna let you have it and tell folks what else you've got planned. Um, so those of you in the audience and online will have an opportunity this weekend to go out and forage with Shan for mushrooms. And we'll be going up near Bono Ferry, I believe, in that general area up on Highway 41 in the Francis Marion. And it looks to be a wonderful time. It looks to be a, a weekend where there will be lots of dampness. And that probably ought to, the humidity will probably be really great for the um, for the mushrooms and so forth. Sounds like a great time. In October, there's always stuff happening in October for everyone. It's a very busy month because the heat finally goes away, kind of, here in South Carolina. And we will have an outing in association with the Native Plant Week. Um, uh, Rebecca, is it the 7th through the 15th or something like that? Anyway, there anyway, there will be some kind of an outing uh, for the oh, 14th through the 19th. There we go. And um, uh, that will probably be led by uh, Rebecca Fanning. And she will do a wonderful job um, um, along, as, uh, along with organizing this Native Plant Week. So, uh, and there will be more things in November, including an, an uh, outings training weekend. So if you think you'd like to become a Sierra Club outings leader, uh, let me know and uh, I'll get you signed up for the outings leading training. And I, with that, I will turn it back over to you, Pat. Righty. Okay, as Star was mentioning, October is going to be a great month for Native Plant Week. As you can see here on October the 10th, we're going to have a symposium for resilient living landscapes. And then the week of the 14th through the 19th, that whole week is Native Plant Week. So we've got some links there. So I hope you will go on to these and look at these, get some more information and consider participating in these. All right, vote, get out and vote. Early voting starts October 21st and goes through October 26th. And then again, October 28th through Saturday, November 2nd. And we are proud to endorse Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz for president and vice president. All right, mark your calendars for next month. Zadik is going to come and tell us about all the cool snakes that we've got in South Carolina. So come out and join us for that. And so now we're going to turn it over to forager Shan Burkholder, who holds a wild mushroom food safety certification with South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control and with similar state agencies from Alabama to Rhode Island. So welcome. Thank you, Pat. I'm honored to have been invited to speak tonight. Pretty straightforward, but set up. Okay. 
It is on. I mean, it's the one we trust right now. Okay. Is that on? This one no longer does the funny thing all right. because I changed the batteries. Welcome all. Who knew that it's National Mushroom Month? September. I met Nina two years ago and she said, you should come talk sometime. And she planned it to where I ended up right here during um, National Mushroom Mushroom Month. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about low country mushrooms that I'm very excited about. If you go in the woods, if you go you down the sidewalks here, you're going to start noticing them now that we've talked about them. They are everywhere. It's such a fascinating world that I've been interested in all my life, but I didn't have the tools to really start getting out and understanding the mushrooms. Here's an example of some of what we'll talk about. You might know the guy there in the middle. That's a, that's a pretty picture, isn't it? It's beautiful, except that it's called the Destroying Angel. That's uh -huh. makes a lot of mycophobes out of people. It's very common. And that's that's been the problem in North America. It just hasn't been common for a lot of uh, people in these cultures to really enjoy mushrooms, take advantage of those. There are cultures around the world that it's deeply ingrained. It's a great source of protein. But the ones that are dangerous, there aren't that many of them, but they're really common. They're out there. If you see one that's white, with a white bulb on the bottom, that's one of the destroying angels. There's three different species there, one called the death camp and the other two called destroying angels. There's a stink horn down there. Those are really pretty, the orange one. The ones on the uh, tree there, the orange ones are uh, deadly gallerina. And then there's a uh, ravenel's big stink horn there. So they call it ravenel's phallus. So sorry to interrupt, folks. I made a mistake, and we are sharing the wrong screen. Give me just a second. <laughs> it works. Great. Stinkhorns. Uh, did he want to back up? Because uh, I didn't know what he was talking about before. Is that okay? You will now. <laughs> so this is the impediment. Scary mushrooms. I've always been a forager. I grew up in the mountains of North Alabama, the Appalachian foothills. I knew the trees and the shrubs and the grasses and the and the fruits. And they're easy to learn. A lot of people knew them. I moved down to the coast 30 years ago, and I started seeing new types of plants that I didn't know, and I wanted to know those. Among those, I wanted to know my mushrooms. I worked at a NASA facility with a mycologist who was a NASA engineer that used those skills in our projects, and he made me feel confident going out in the woods with him, but there was not any good books available. Petersons are great guides, don't get me wrong, but the first couple of three, four, five pages you read in there are warnings. And then there's only a few color plates that only have a couple of views, and then there's the black and white plates. And so it just says, don't eat these unless you're 100% sure. And I couldn't get 100% sure with that particular guide. So I grabbed Richard Porche's Wildflowers of the Low Country and wore that thing out. I went out trying to learn a new species every weekend, try to find all of the native orchids that are out here. And there's so much public land. I had 250,000 acres of Francis Marion right across the creek from me. I was out every weekend. Every time there was a big event down in Charleston, my wife would chuckle because she knew I was going the opposite direction out into the woods, out into the swamps. After about 15 years, we realized we were relearning things we forgot. And I wanted to get into something else. 
And a farmer friend told me that he had just gotten certified to sell mushrooms in the state. That bell went off in my head. I said, I better look into this again. And what did I find? Embarrassment of riches. So many good field guides, so many experts out there. Have you seen fantastic fungi? Fungi? Isn't that great? I could probably name a few of the preeminent mycologists that are out there, and you would know them from the news media uh, and entertainment. Wait for this. It's such an embarrassment of riches. It's great. So many good books out there. I listed, I, I reference a lot of what I say, and then I can provide you with references for all of these books. I'll tell you which ones are my favorite. There are a few that, there are two that I carry in the field with me every time I go out here. So if you want to go out and find mushrooms, whether you want to look at them, photograph them, make a tincture or eat them, you need to know something about the mushroom. Like, what is a mushroom? It's just the fruiting body of another or a larger organism. Mycelia, these little thread-like needles are penetrating and surrounding and going all through the media that you see that mushroom coming out of. They are absorbing nutrients from all of the decaying matter around them and then some are exchanging nutrients. Paul Stamets calls it the network, neural network of nature. So that's the strategy. You want to know what the mushroom does for a living to find out where to look for it. Also, the let's get here. Oh, no. The use. What are you planning to use it for? And then what fruiting conditions, like the rain we just had and it being fall, I am comp I have confidence that there will be a mushroom outside somewhere. And then you need to know a little bit about the structure of the mushroom to identify it to be confident that you're getting something. So the strategy. I like the way that Eugenia Bone simplifies the strategy into mutualists, decomposers, and parasites. That will help you find and identify the mushrooms. Mutualists are cool. They wrap around the thread-like roots at the very edge, very end of the root system, and start exchanging nutrients with a tree. They sweat moisture and carbon dioxide, and they bring up minerals and nutrients, and the tree provides them with carbohydrates, carbohydrates and sugars. And it's, they, they become somewhat dependent on that relationship. The scientists I was working with at NASA, we were flying sensors over the trees and looking for stress. Well, he would stress them by stressing out the mycelial network. He would inoculate those, and then the trees would respond because they weren't getting the nutrients they needed. So decomposers, those are all over the place. Organic material is always breaking down. There's all different types of mushrooms that use that, and that's where the majority of the mushrooms that you see in your kitchen come from. They're easy to grow in that material. Then there's a they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, the parasite is drawing its nutrient from something else. To my knowledge, you don't typically see those uh, created or on farms. But they're also uh, breaking down nutrients. But mutualism, you can't recreate that in the lab easily, on the farm easily. So that's where power is. Those are the ones that are rare. Those are the ones that are hard to get. Those are the ones you cannot typically walk down the shelf in the grab one off the shelf in the store. Mutualism. Cool stuff.
It gives us things like morels. It has a heartbreaking relationship with Chinese privet on my farm, I discovered. <laughs> I'm killing the privet, and then these are in my way. And then the black trumpets, you'll you will find you want to find a black trumpet right now? Go find a white oak tree. You're looking up as much as you're looking down, you're going to try to find, try to find mushrooms. Then the chanterelles, aren't they aren't they gorgeous? It's like flowers popping out everywhere. You can really see them well yellow. They they like hardwoods. And then orchids. Every orchid you ever see depends on a fungi some, at some point in its life to be able to bloom. And it's a mutualistic relationship. As far as finding the conditions that you want, I'm, I'm a GIS, remote sensing, geographic information system, remote sensing, data and analyst type person. So it was easy for me. This is the Francis Marion Forest and the various forest groups that they have. If I want to find hen of the woods, I know that it's only going to grow on a very old hardwood tree that it is unfortunately hollowing out. So I would look for an old forest, like, oh, here's one that was established in 1911. Of course, those are always great places to hike anyway. When Trad Potter first set up the certification process in South Carolina, he talked to the state uh, Department of Natural Resources, and he talked to the USDA, uh, National Forest Service, about where people could go to forage. And there's already agreements in the Pacific Northwest and out west where they're used to people foraging. So he got what turned out to be, I guess, verbal agreements. The next time I got certified, instead of saying, you can go on a wild, any wildlife management area, he said, ask for permission. So he doesn't want to have to keep coming back because apparently there wasn't anything written. I tried to get a letter of permission from a biologist right when COVID started, and that kind of shut down our, our talk. So it's good to have private land to explore, to, to forage on, but it's great to explore everywhere. Now, what, what is your use for this mushroom? Is it attractive? We'll see some very uh, uh, pretty pictures. And then there's some that are structurally interesting. My mom painted everything that I brought home. If I brought a rock home, she would paint it for me barn wood. Then my dad started growing gourds and she had the, the best media in the world to paint on, but I think I'm going to bring her an artist conch and see what she can do with it. And I've got a list of some of my favorite books right here that tell you about uh, each of these. There's a lot of it, it, edible, a lot of good edible mushrooms available. We'll, we'll, talk about a lot of those tonight. We'll see those on Saturday. And then the book I recommended is the, the local one, the Field Guide to Mushrooms in the Carolinas. And the reason I did is because they always have one section in the description of the mushroom. This is, is it edible, edibility? So that makes, that's very convenient. Medicinal, there's a lot of medicinal mushrooms out there. A lot of people go looking for something called turkey tail, uh, we're finding out that the mushroom, a lot of mushrooms we have a lot of healthful properties. And then maybe a utilitarian use, like for fiber or erosion control or biocontrol. If you read Trad Cotter or Paul Stamets' work, Paul Stamets actually is an entrepreneur who started producing these organisms that parasitize insects. Biocontrol. And then, well, let me see this. Okay. So, okay, here's an attractive mushroom, fun to look at, fun to go photograph. Another beautiful one that's highly prized, that's edible. That's the lion's mane. There, there may be some out right now. They're Substitute for crab meat in some dishes. And then 
medicinal. This is reishi or ling zi, another woody type mushroom that people uh, make a tea out of or a tincture. And <clears throat> this is a tender conch that nomads used to use. It's hard to start a fire. If you had one of these, you'd haul it out a little bit, drop an ember from the fire, put it in a leather bag and ignore it till you get to your next camping spot. By the time you get there, it hasn't burned you and it's slowly, slowly, it's got plenty of air to slowly consume that tender conch. So when, next time you're on Survivor and you're going to your challenge, <laughs> you're gonna be a hero if it rains during your challenge and you did this. All right, you need to know something about fruiting conditions. Uh, season makes a, a big difference. It's fall. It's a very exciting time for mushroom hunters. Temperature. During a season that a organism typically fruits, if it gets too hot or cold, you might not expect to see it, so you wouldn't go out. And then the amount of rainfall that you get. So it's coming in the fall. It's starting to cool down a little bit, and it's rained. I have a little confidence that we're going to see a mushroom. There might be chanterelles, milk caps, black trumpets. I anticipate those. And there might be oysters, chicken of the woods, and lion's mane. Structure. Another identifying feature. Sorry, there's a lot of words on that slide, but you basically need your field guide manual because you're going to look in the field guide manual at these things. So what is the cap color, shape, surface? What is the stalk color? Does it have a veil? And then if anybody's ever used a, a bi binary that's not the right, right word. Anywhere, try to try to tee out a species, either or. It doesn't take long before you end up having to find a spore print. So it's not easy to do in the field. You'll be going through the either or key, and then it says spore print. And this is a poor example of one that usually takes overnight to get so. You're gonna ask me what a mushroom is and I'm gonna key it out and I'm gonna say, sorry, I'll tell you tomorrow. So chanterelles, uh, I am going to show you a few of my favorite mushrooms and I am going to use the criteria that we just talked about to look at those. Around here, we have primarily uh, three species of chanterelles. It's cantharellus is the genus name. They are mutualists. They're also decomposers, but heavily dependent on hardwoods. You're going to find those emerging from the ground. They're not going to be sticking out of a piece of wood. They are a choice edible. They fruit throughout the summer, usually after a little bit of rain. I'm hoping there'll be some available soon. I have a buyer that would like me to bring them some. And I only, I'm a specialist. I only bring black trumpets, which are hard to get and very special in a meal. But they're asking me for these golden chanterelles. When you're looking for them, they're yellow and vase shaped. And you want to know what type of fertile surface they have, like gills. In this case, it's veined. It looks like ridges running up underneath the cap. There's a lot of yellow mushrooms in the woods. Don't take home the one that has the gills and think it's chanterelle. And the great thing about chanterelles is they just stand out when you look at them. You see that yellow off in the distance, you know to head straight over there. And they're abundant. And the what makes that great is you can be selective. Get the best, most 
robust samples that you can. And that would be one that, look here on the left. Oh, I see ridges there. Okay, that tells me it's a chanterelle. It should be white in the middle. If you break it open, it's not white. It's not a chanterelle. And it should look like string cheese. Get those home. I usually just break them up by hand. And there's a, a lot of delicious things you can do with them. They work very well, sauteed, and they pair well with, by themselves, that's the one on the left is just an appetizer that people are eating as we talk, and then there's fish, and then pairs well with uh, the steaks, and it roasts well. Bunch of... Uh, chanterelles with vegetables and a little bit of oil, salt and pepper on the grill with the meat. Okay, when it comes to sauteing, I'm gonna give you a hint if you don't already know. Maybe you've tried to cook golden chanterelles before and they weren't as delicious as you were told. The secret is to dry saute. There's a lot of moisture in that mushroom. Break it down. You see how well I, like I actually put that on the cutting board, broke it down well. Put it into a hot skillet, and it will start to sizzle for a moment, move it around. It's not going to stick. Move it around a little bit, and all of a sudden, it releases all the moisture. Then, that's when you put in your oil, butter, salt, or pepper. Throw in those flavorings, and all of a sudden, it soaks it right back up, and you have a very well cooked mushroom. When you're out there looking for mushrooms, like I said, try to find a, a good looking sample. After a rain, those raindrops are spewing grit everywhere. So if you look under a chanterelle this weekend, there might be a lot of grit. And the thing about the mushroom is it's continuing to grow. It's gonna grow around that sand. So it's, some people, if they're desperate to eat a chanterelle, will take a toothbrush and just brush all the skin off. So you can you can soak them in water a little bit if you really need to, but if you have enough chanterelles around, leave that one behind. Uh, who else likes chanterelles? When you cut one, you may see, well, actually, you know what I do? I reach down and I grab the stem. And if it's not firm like that first cut picture I was showing you. I know that insects have been up in there. Gnat flies like to lay their eggs in organic matter. They don't know that there's going to be a mushroom popping up. They just know it's a good place. When that pop mushroom pops up, the larvae go straight up into the stem and through the top. So it's okay to eat these too. You can cut it in half and brush all that stuff out if you're really desperate for a mushroom. I, if I'm going to give them to friends, I don't. So there's the fungus gnat. When you eat them up, kill those. Well, they yeah, they're going to die when you uh, carry them home and cook them. It's the grit that's in there with them. If you heat them up, it's bonus protein, right? <laughs> So that's what I look for right there. No more than maybe three holes. Because that means they haven't been all that busy bringing grit and making poo. Also, look and see, you know, what does it look like? What's around? You can see where they've kind of come out the top. The nets have come out of the top, but it also looks like something's been on it. It's okay, you can wash all that off if you care, but that's a hint. Who has collected chanterelles? This is usually the one that yeah, most people know about. They're, they're good, they're gonna be out there. How about oyster mushrooms? Another good common one that's easy to identify. Golden chanterelles don't really have anything you can mix them up with. As long as you're not grabbing something that has gills, you're good. 
these are these are great. They're decomposers, emerging from hardwoods, choice edibles. They're fruiting in the spring and the fall. I like them in the wintertime when there's not many ground flushing mushrooms because I can windshield survey. I can see them from way off in the woods. They're white. And the reason that they're called an oyster is not because they're slimy. It's because they're shaped like an oyster shell. And they have true gills. Uh, the spore print is kind of a, a pale purple what would be another name for that? Lilac. And they have a white interior. There's a close-up example of something that looks like an oyster shell to me. I can see where that name came from. They're beautiful. And they're abundant. You can, break, you can take that by hand and just start splitting it apart into light, delicate, beautiful pieces. Trad Cotter recommends lightly frying those, and he calls them oyster straws, like that. And Mepkin Abbey has started growing these mushrooms. There's a lot of farmers and research, so you're getting interesting varieties. Notice how bluish those are. You can get pink, yellow, blue. If you have not seen fantastic fungi, you'll see some time lapse Calgary of, of those growing. Well, somebody else happens to like oyster mushrooms. The handsome fungus and the pleasing fungus beetle. I'm not happy with either of them, but you will see them. You can, you can find a fresh flush that no adults have emerged from, and then you'll just be getting the extra protein from the eggs and the larva. But typically you'll see these little black things flying around the bottom. Take your paintbrush, your knife, and just start tapping the top, try to get most to come out. But you can find, you know, there's plenty of clean, good looking samples out there. Typically they grow looking like that oyster shell. They're a decomposer that comes out of a tree when a tree falls down, if the mycelial network's inside of it, it's got a good opportunity to come straight out of the top. So I got all these pie-shaped oyster mushrooms and had an idea of what to do with them. They made a very, a very healthy pizza crust. And I made oyster Rockefeller with them. It was a surprise for my wife, and she liked it so much that she surprised me with it the next night. Let's get excited about morels. Morels are not necessarily in the low country. I don't know if it's the soil temperature doesn't meet their needs or... Yeah, okay. It takes enough time below 40 degrees or below freezing? Typically from Columbia on up to the upstream. Yeah, the, the ones that I have found... We found a few around here, but it's kind of weird. If you get to where the Marl Bluffs are up on the Upper Cooper, that's where you start seeing them a little bit. And I, here's the problem. 20-something years ago, I saw a morel there. I knew it was a morel, but I didn't know to go look for more. But every year I would kind of come back and I saw another one 20 years later. And I still, it was just, you know, it was before I got in all my mushroom books. And I knew that they're gigantic, old sycamore and gigantic, old pula poplars right there. I crawled on my hands and knees starting in January a couple of years ago. Every weekend. And you know where they were? Chinese fruit. Okay, they're mutualists. They're exchanging nutrients with another organism, typically elm, tulip poplar, apple, sycamore, Chinese privet. They emerge from the ground. They are a choice edible. People get very excited about these. 
They're robust, nutty. They fruit in the spring when the soil temperature gets above 45, 55 degrees. And there is a wave of excitement across the nation as those temperatures achieve those temperatures in the morale community. There's uh, the yellow and black varieties. Typically you'll see a yellow, grayish, or black color. They have that honeycomb appearance, cupped fertile surface, reddish orange brown spore print, and you've got to look for the hollow interior. If it's marbled on the inside, it's gynomitra and it'll make you very sick. So it'll be nice and hollow. Oh, here's the excitement. Uh, notice how the base of these are hollow. So you should see, be able to see right up into those. These came from my farm in Alabama. They weren't from down here while I was trying to, cut, to, to kill Chinese privet. <laughs> There's a real big one right there. The farmer had pushed some chi old Chinese privet bushes up out of away from the farm field, which was stressing out those bushes, which made the morel think, oh, we're going to die. We better put out all of our genetic material now and make those big mushrooms. The rest of those are about as big as your thumb, the ones in the basket in the middle, and the ones on the left by the pocket knife, or you can see the scale in that. There's one of the great big ones that I grilled with some venison, made a luscious burger. How long is it gonna be before I get to do that again? Lion's mane, another one to get excited about. Another one that's rare, easy to find though, because it's growing up in a tree. It's a decomposer merging from dead or dying hardwoods. The map I showed you earlier, if you can, read a map, read terrain, and make a guess where hardwoods are going to be stressed, dead or dying, maybe toward a drought or they're in sandy, well-drained soil. I did that and I've always been able to find these easily. Right, right, Randy? They are a choice edible, seafoodish, almost like a scallop in texture or a lobster in texture. People do use them as a substitute for, for crab, crab meat. They do have many healthful medicinal benefits promoting nerve growth in the brain. Fruit primarily the spring and fall, I, they're, they're my winner, along with oyster mushrooms. You might see them anytime from now until sometime in the spring. They're white, look like a pom-pom. Their fertile surface is tooth-spined. They have a white spore, pen, spore print and a white interior. They are just lovely. This, These were, they're all in my GPS. I, I just know to come back year after year after year. I'm not harming the organism. I'm doing it a favor. I'm carrying a spore further away from its base. <laughs> I, that was more than I wanted to try to process. So on Facebook Marketplace, I put out a little advertisement and somebody saw that and called their friend who just moved down here from Oregon, who drove to my house with a hundred dollar bill in her hand. So excited to find it. So you can, there's the white, you break them up, notice that it's more solid on the inside, but you've got those tendrils that are almost like crab meat. They sa saute down quite well. Once they're sauteed down, that could be a meal there. It could go into a, a stir fry or, or a soup, or that could be the base of the crab cakes or something like that. Black trumpet is one that I get very excited about. It's another of the mutualists, so it's not one that you're going to find being grown commercially. They love white oaks. I love to find a mixed forest that is pine trees and white oaks. That way, 
Notice how there's pine needles all around those mushrooms. I'm not digging around dirt and mess. They're nice and clean. I can find them. And it's when you're in that mixed hard, mixed forest, walking through the pines, it's easy to find a, a white oak tree. Go from tree to tree and, and look all around the, uh, the, the rain drip area. Choice edible, they have a unique, marvelous texture, aroma, and flavor, and they are a beautiful addition to a dish. It adds another color. They don't look like anything you want to eat thin and leathery, but they are they have a, a, a nice bite to them, and they're uh, just a great, great flavor. They, you might find them in black, gray, cream-colored. They will be funnel-shaped. It's almost like you're looking for holes, someone told me, because of the shadow on the inside of the ring. Uh, they have a smooth, fertile surface with a white tomato spore print, and they're hollow like a funnel. And when you find them, it's you find one stop. Watch out where your next step is. Once you see that one that caught your eye and you stop, all of a sudden your eyes become trumpet eyes and they're all around you. And it's a it's a great, it's a treasure hunt, right? So they're they're beautiful, they're fun. They only they're only abundant starting now through October. They're I'm finding I'm not exclusively mutualistic because I'm finding them a long way away from any hardwood source out there breaking down organic material. So this time of year is when I start finding those that don't have any kind of mycelial connection that I can find to another organism. Maybe it's a shrub out there like like my Chinese privet was. I'll have to look this year. But she's not. I put in the time and the effort and the fun to crawl around and fill up a basket. And like I said, I, I sell these once a year to the restaurants downtown. And if you see any black trumpets here in the next uh, few weeks, you might know where they came from. Another one that are easy to find, a lot of people know about, are Chicken of the Woods. Anybody seen, eaten, know Chicken of the Woods? Or wondered what that thing on the tree was? Pretty prolific. You might start seeing them now. They're, when they're growing, they're real spongy. Uh, as they get older, the handsome bugs will get them. And they'll also start to harden a little bit. But this is a, a pretty example. All of those margins that are white are prime. But it goes all the way back through that orange portion that, that I would eat. They're decomposers emerging from dead and dying hardwoods. They are chickeny edible. They do have uh, healthful and medicinal properties, primary, primarily out uh, late spring to fall. They're shelf forming, going to be yellow or orange. And their fertile surface is uh, a pore. They're called a polypore. You cut them open, they'll have a yellow interior. So they're not called chicken of the woods because they look like a chicken. They're called chicken of the woods because you could cook, you could fry some chicken of the woods and put it in a McDonald's bag and your kids would not believe you that you fed them mushrooms. And the, the texture, juiciness, flavor, chicken of the woods is a good thing. So you'll see it in a lot of forms, also called sulfur shelf. Usually these shelves, sometimes there's another uh, variety, Cincinnatus, that will emerge from dead wood underground. So you might see some that doesn't look like it's attached to wood. And it does have one thing that you might mix it up with. But once you started cutting into the velvet top polypore, probably wouldn't want to carry it home anyway. You get a little slimy. So don't see much of that out there, but if you want to go find chicken of the woods, you're not going to run into any trouble unless you see the velvet top polypore. Watch for that. Hint of the woods. This is another one that restaurants salivate for. Also called mitake. 
uh, Grifola frondosa. They are uh, both parasite and a consumer found in hardwoods, especially white oak. This is a uh, this tree is on my farm where the old stagecoach crossing on the creek was. Uh, a limb fell off from 30 feet up 10 years ago when my buddy started counting the rings while we were clearing it out of the way. He counted up to 130. And it's probably had this organism growing with it for 70 years. It followed it out and it's starting to take a lean, but I get 20 pounds of uh, some pretty glorious mushrooms out of it each year. And they, they save well. I can throw those in the cooler and get them home and start freezing them. And they really hold up to that well. Choice edible, firm and meaty. Find them in the fall. The one on my tree is usually October. The grayish, uh, polypore, pore surfaces, white spore print. I didn't know these were fruiting, flushing one day because the grass had grown up so high around the tree. When I started seeing this white dust come up around me off the grass, it was the spores. They were getting all over everything. Uh, don't confuse it with a black staining polypore. You probably won't, because it'll stain black. Uh, there's my big tree starting to take a lean. Uh, you can see the texture and the just the, the bulk of that mushroom. There's a lot to it. So that was me trying to figure out where I'm going to get enough coolers to take that home. That was only a small portion of it. Another one you may be familiar with is uh, the honey mushroom, not because it tastes like honey, but because of the color. They're also a parasite. I don't want to spread their spores around, but they're everywhere anyway. These were popping up all over the farm when we showed up one year, so I harvested a whole bunch and threw them in there with the alligator stew, and they were fine. That's the, a picture of the same group there. You see all this little tiny colony popping out the side. And then there's some, some that were at the farm there on the right. So they just see them growing out of the base of trees. Uh, killing a tree or, or, or killed it. Another fun one are wood ears. These also uh, are they're not a parasite. They're just consuming uh, dead wood. Look like an ear. Auricula auriculara. There you go. Cut those off, put them on in a paper bag. They're dehydrated by the time you get home. Like they're like you have in your Chinese soups. They dehydrate well, they rehydrate well. Cook them before you eat them. You might think about eating that nice jelly texture but you got to cook it but when you do if you cool it back down and just use it in, in place of lettuce and a salad it's pretty great cauliflower is one you might see out right now it grows at the base of pine trees typically uh, and they're another easy one to find when you're out hiking and they're beautiful we we use one of these as a pasta substitute. And there's an example of an artist's conch that my art. So that is a wood conch growing on the side of a tree. The fertile surface is soft. And if you're a good artist or you have dexterity, you could make a beautiful engraving. And overnight it would be hard. And you could like rub your hands all over it. It would not come right back off. Nina met me at the annual mushroom gathering held by Grow Food Carolina. She was there eating mushroom themed dishes from the chefs downtown. I was a featured forager. They have that annual gathering to celebrate the, the certification process that Grow Food Carolina and Trad Cotter put together. So I got certified in 18 and recertified in, in 2023. Now I have a key for this code that somebody can scan on my card 
because they keep adding states. Now I'm from Alabama to Rhode Island, and the next time I look at their website, it'll be up in the Great Lakes probably. Thank you. Really? Yes. Uh, hold, please. Actually, I'm going to bring you the mic so that the people on Zoom can hear you. So let me run down there. And while we prepare for that, we had um, one quick clarification question. Uh, you know, we saw scissors and knives and baskets and boxes. Can you tell us a little bit about your tools, towels, coolers, maybe? You're set up when you go foraging. Answer that question now. Yeah, that'd be great. If you're planning on bringing home mushrooms, notice I've got a basket there, uh, a knife, scissors. Go down to the base of your chanterelles. Anything coming out of the ground, you can you cut at the base. You can pluck them right out of the ground, too, and you might see a little my mycelia come up, but that's not part of the active, healthy organism. There, there was some debate about whether plucking was bad for the organism, and most people say cut, but the people that really know say it doesn't, doesn't matter. I, I cut. I don't pluck. Um, a knife to cut something off of a tree. Uh, need a nice basket. I've got a knife on a 25 foot pole for some of the mushrooms that I find. Keep all your mushrooms separate. Now, going out Saturday, you may want a lot of mushroom samples to come home and identify. So, you can, I guess you could throw them in together and different, categorize them. But when you're going to bring them home to eat, keep them all separate. So, I keep like a basket or paper bag and boxes that can keep everything separate in a cooler. Got to keep them cooled down 38 to 42 degrees. Do not enclose them in anything. Like I said, they are excreting, expelling carbon dioxide and, and everything can start to turn to mush rapidly. Does that answer the question or anything else about that? I can tell you a lot about the, the way I dress and look out for all the things that want to hurt me out there. Um, a number of years ago, I went out to the Sumter National Board. I went to the forestry office in Whitmire, get a permit. I said, no problem, they get that permit. I did the same thing at Weatherby for the Francis Mary. And the lady there says, no, we don't have permits. You cannot dig those in Francis Mary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Have a nice day. Yeah. That's they're both part of the same network. Is it still like this? The the Witherby station is gone and they're up uh, by UG now, they consolidated. Last time I went in and tried to find somebody to talk to, they were aghast that I would want to mess with something as fetid as a mushroom. So they finally I was talking to a biologist, a, a wildlife biologist, not a botanist. And we had a meeting plan, and that was like March 18th of 2020. So we lost contact. And I, I got private land that I can go to. Basically, like Trad said originally, he talked to the states and the USDA and, and said, hey, people are hunting out on these wildlife management areas, they're paying for wildlife management area permits. This is an ephemeral resource that is gonna be gone tomorrow if you don't take it home today. And people want those. And if you look at USDA, US Forest Service out West, they know how to manage those. So it's not something that they shouldn't be able to figure out here. I, did, I quit pursuing it. Um, Law enforcement will might ask you for permit to remove wood from the forest or something. I usually get those to, to cut wood in the forest. They think you've got to have a permit for everything, and you might end up 
having to work out uh, who's allowed to do that. I, I just don't make a big scene about looking for mushrooms. I'm out there, you know, with photo taking pictures and enjoying. And if I find something I want to take home, take it home, but not not in any bulk. There's a lot of artifacts, but you know, when we're out mushrooms, that's what we're looking. The, I don't have really had anybody come up. Yeah, they're, they're particularly sensitive in the low country because of the Antiquities Act and all of the history they don't want you messing with. But this has nothing to do with that. So my question is not being a far insurance. Yeah. Because um, this is kind of exciting stuff. Um, so it makes me sad to see the mushrooms in the grocery stores and those little boxes with the plastic on the top. And when I come home, the first thing I do is take them out of the boxes and put them in something where the top is open. Is there a way I can prolong their freshness? Most most mushrooms are going to be a week um, at most, the wild foraged ones. The ones that you get at the grocery store have been farmed for decades and they have weeded out the ones that aren't going that are going to break down rapidly so those can stay in a sealed container for a whole week remarkably uh, maybe the conditions have their growth cut off where they're not expelling as much carbon dioxide most of i would say i don't know as far as those go pardon most of them so they right. won't be shipped over here in the week. Right. It's going to go pretty fast yeah. after a week. It's like, yeah. I, I put most mushrooms in paper bags uh, in the refrigerator and eat them within a week. But you can you can dehydrate. You can saute and freeze. Oh. If you've got a lot of mushrooms, you can get them in the freezer or you can get them in a... Uh, there's one way I like to, to dehydrate mushrooms it's uh desiccation you know the silic silic silicon beads um that suck up sap up moisture i just made a chamber where i put them put mushrooms in there they dry out just like that and then they're, they're ready to rehydrate and cook okay uh, and so there's a couple of questions in the zoom chat same time so thank you for asking that uh, we also have uh a question about clear cutting in the woods, excuse me, clear cutting timber in the woods and how that affects mushrooms in the forest. That has a huge impact. Like I mentioned earlier, that network of mycelia just running through everything, breaking down organic matter. If they weren't there, that organic matter would really be piling up. But these are huge organisms, some of them. And they can communicate. I, I could tell you some stories about how they communicate with trees on my farm and with the NASA mycologist I used to work with. So yes, there's a big impact. We don't notice it that much, but you know, ecologically, well, biologically, if you were in there studying it, you could learn a lot. I don't know if you saw that they... Uh, hooked up the controls to a robot in to a to a mushroom and just let the signals that were being sent out of the mycelia drive the robot recently. So there's all there's stuff going on. Signals always coming out, going through the mycelia. Uh, if you watch Fantastic Fungi, if you read uh, the memoirs like um, Eugenia Bones, uh, Mycophilia, they go into detail about what's going on when you even just step on the ground and interact with that mycelial network, but especially taking out the trees makes a difference. Because a lot of the bacteria and fungus are the foundation of the food web there, and you're killing off great components, great portions of it. So I think we might have one more question from in the room, maybe all we have time for. That's Mike. I have dehydrated mushrooms 
And the problem I had with them is that um, they never, when I cook them or you know try to put them in a soup or a stew, they become they they stay incredibly chewy. And so what I have ended up doing is basically powdering them, and they're very nice to put in anything when you have them powdered. But is there something I'm doing wrong that they stay so incredibly chewy after you dehydrated them? Did you put them in a bowl of cold water for five minutes first? No, I just throw them right in. Yeah, you gotta you gotta rehydrate them. But grinding them into powder and putting it in your coffee or your soup is uh, a tried and true method. I have a whole bunch of those lion's mane at the house dehydrated that are ready to grind and, and start making concoctions, helpful concoctions. Thank you so much. No more questions from the audience? This is great. It was my pleasure. Uh, before we leave, um, there's someone else that I think we all need to recognize, and that's Rebecca. I don't know if you read her article in Sunday's paper. We've got it right there. Rebecca has a fantastic article in this past Sunday's paper on native plants in Sullivan's Island. She's doing a lot of work with that. We need to give Rebecca a big hand too. Go ahead. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming out. Go get some mushrooms. A quick other announcement is there is still room on Saturday's mushroom foraging trip. So you should go to our website, Robert Loves Group, Sierra Club, you need to come out and, and uh, sign up for that. You ever have time to do things like that? Oh, oh, uh, no, I, I live on the occasion. Go to new locations. All right. Okay.